The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me and your copy of Holy Scripture to the first chapter of Revelation. Now, some of you may be looking at your bulletin a little puzzled, but that's my mistake, having the call to worship and the Scripture text reversed there. But I will be in Revelation chapter 1, reading verses 4 through 8 there this morning. Revelation of John, chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priest serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Now, God, give us ears to hear, ears that hear your words and not the ones I put in the way, eyes to see the way you have forward for us, Open hands and open hearts to receive what you have, and willing feet and bodies to follow wherever you may call us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, here lately, Cole likes to play a little game where he will ask me, Hey, Dada, what is three plus four equal? And I'll say, Except some of you, it took a minute. I could see, you're like, we didn't know math was a part of church. It's seven. Most of the time it's like that. Sometimes it's a bit silly. Dad, Dad, what's seven plus chicken? And I'll say, oh, that's easy, hamburger, obviously. But now his thing is to say, what's infinity plus a million? Oh, that's an easy one. It's still infinity. How can it still be infinity? Well, infinity is everything. It's as far as you can go. It's, it's a number that just keeps on going. It's everything. It, it holds all the other numbers. It's forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And you can never stop saying ever and ever. I even drew him the infinity symbol. Now when we have sidewalk chalk outside, he'll do that. Or he'll, he'll take like uh, some glow sticks he got back at Easter and bend them around and go, Dad, is this the infinity symbol? Yeah, that, that's it. Infinity over and over. I don't expect his four going on five-year-old mind to understand the concept of infinity because, honestly, I'm not sure I always understand it. I think most of us probably don't really understand it because I think all we can imagine is just a, a tiny segment of all that is infinity, all that is eternity. After all, we're finite people. We can't fully comprehend the concept of something that lasts forever in both directions, in all directions. We see things as having a beginning and an end. And sure, there are really old things, things that last for a really, really, really long time. But just as sure as those things had a beginning, we're sure they're going to have an end. That just seems to be the way the cosmos works, even the universe itself or whatever you may ascribe to, uh, scientists say it began with a big bang, and eventually it's going to end somehow. It's got to. Energy will run out, they say. Everything that has a beginning, it's got to have an end. And maybe that's why we, we struggle so much, while we worry about things, while we fight amongst ourselves, because we can't see the true reality of things. We can't grasp the full concept of infinity. We strive to hold on to what we have, to hold on to what is temporary because it's all we know. Whether it's the things that are certain or even if it's things like grief. 
Because the grief we feel is really just fleeting in the face of forever. That whatever we think is so pressing, so important, so worth fighting for today, is so small and unimportant in the grand view of forever. Makes me think about those preachers back in the 50s, a little bit before I was born, with their crew cuts, their neckties so tight like mine, and your fat kind of bulges out a little bit, talking about how Elvis was the devil, and rock music was going to send everybody to hell. And that just seems silly now, doesn't it? Especially to some of you who are like, I listened to Elvis on the way to church this morning. We worship a God who, is, who has simultaneously created and still resides within the eternal. And I don't know about you, but, but I have to stop and take that in every once in a while to give myself some perspective, to remind myself of where it really is that I reside. I think that's one of the reasons John in this revelation from Jesus, go out of, goes out of his way right from the beginning to describe God in such eternal, infinite terms. Grace to you and peace from Him who is, who was, and who is to come. To Him, John says, be glory and dominion forever and ever. And even closing it out, God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, as far back as you can remember and as far forward as you can think, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty, John says. This God in Christ isn't some new creation, some new divinity on the scene of the universe. And God, by the way, God hasn't disappeared, slipped behind the veil of the cosmos, leaving humanity on some spinning blue marble to figure out how the whole thing works. It's not what he says. God's not waiting until a time, a good time for the end to stop the whole mess. God is not just the latest thing to come along to provide excuses for things like floods, famines, and fights. Nor is God some handy justification for one's own prejudices. An, an invisible being whose name can be so easily invoked when seeking to justify ignorance. God was, is, and is to come. God was then, is now, and will always be. God is eternal. Of all the things we can wrap our mind, even the number, concept of affinity, God is bigger than that, eternal. And that means the fullness of God is really beyond our knowing, really beyond our guessing, beyond our certainties. And it can't help but stretch our minds and humble us just a little to reflect on the eternal reality that God is. I think about this sometimes whenever I face something new, something strange, something uncomfortable. Like when we made the decision to adopt our first child, we had no clue what we were doing, no clue what we were really getting into, had no clue how much money it would cost us, how much sleep it would cost us, how much time, how much comfort, how many pieces of paper it would cost our printer. But we could see each signpost along the way, sometimes printed in front of us on a sheet of paper, with each one seeming more daunting or more expensive than the last one. We weren't sure we'd ever get the money or if the timing would work out. And I, 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 say, I say we, but I know I wasn't so sure. If I'd passed the psychological exam we had to take when we were in the Columbia program, I was nervous the whole time that they were going to say, this man is crazy. And on top of all these sorts of questions came the normal worries, fears, and concerns of being first-time parents, only exacerbated by the constant preparation by our agency that we might not only adopt a child with special needs or, or, or mental needs or social needs, but that we might actually adopt the devil himself sometimes. Then you start wondering, would we be good parents to any child, especially when they come running and with teeth? Could we actually care for a child that was certainly, we were told, going to have these needs? Would we be able to even make it to and through the flight there and back without feeling as if we've gotten in over our heads? I have no doubt that Sally faced these questions with more courage than me, but it wasn't until we were on the plane in L.A. and we were heading for China, and I stopped, and I took a deep breath, and I said... You'll get to where you need to go. You'll do what you need to do. 
And before you know it, you'll be crying about it in the pulpit like a sissy. It calms me down every time. To think that in the big picture, in the moment, to know that this panic, this fear, this frustration, this joy, this disappointment, this doubt, whatever it is, to know that this moment is just that. It's a moment. A fleeting fraction of forever. And that always, weirdly, seems to bring me a bit of peace. To know that there will come one morning when you'll wake up, And whatever it is you're going through is just a memory. And that the day is new. And that whatever it was you were worried about, you may even, even in your heart, try to find some way to ask forgiveness for ever worrying about it in the first place. I think that's why John begins this cryptic, often scary-sounding letter with these descriptions of a God who was, who is, and who is to come. To remind his readers, to remind us, who may be facing the, the, uh, the, the temptations to assimilate into a culture that doesn't value the teachings of an eternal Christ, those who may be even facing persecution at the hands of other local religions, even those who may be glorying in their own faithfulness, that while these trials, temptations, and glories may seem enormous now, they may seem like big wins or great deep losses. In the scope of eternity, they will pass. And what will be left is what has always been. God. I was talking with someone just this week after another funeral. We talked about how you can go by these cemeteries and there's these great obelisks, great monuments to people. And when they were placed there, they thought, man, they'll know my name forever. And now people walk by and go, I don't even know who this is. Because forever is so much longer than we can imagine. I think that's a truth we need to hear now just as much as those seven churches in Asia Minor needed to hear it then. Because you and I, we hear the same news. I hear the same stories about people who've been out of work for years, who've given up on finding a job. I hear the stories about children who've been rejected by their parents because of who they are. I hear the same stories about violence and fear driven by those who seem to know better. I see the images of men and women bloody and weeping after their church in Sri Lanka has been bombed, of the Jewish faithful wounded and frightened after another gunman comes into another place of worship to open fire, of the crowded families seeking shelter and safety even from those they know will be hesitant to provide it. And I hear the ignorance that always follows such stories, the excuses that come after seeing such images. And my heart breaks, and my stomach turns, and my eyes well up, and my fists clench. But the words of Scripture remind me that I worship a Christ who is, who was, and is to come. That it's not the end now, and there's more to come. Then I get a call from a friend who tells me the biopsy showed cancer. I learn that another friend lost a baby at birth. Another friend is in a medically induced coma. I hear about layoffs, pink slips, a father gone too early, a lousy interview, bounced checks, press charges, divorces, foreclosures, repossessions. I listen to a mother, another mother, tell me about an addicted child while another one drops out of school. There's another school shooting in the news, and I'm ready to throw in the towel to scream at the top of my lungs, to run out in my front yard and shake my fists at heaven and demand an answer from God. And then I remember. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord. All of those heartbreaking stories, all of that frustrating news, all the minor annoyances of my life that pile on day after day, week after week, they all fade into nothing into the light of the eternal God and the truth. That the very same God does not reside some far off place waiting for me to go through it alone, but that the very same God of eternity lives in those stories with me. That very same God who was, is, and is to come lives in the moments with me, with you, with those newly diagnosed friends, with those outcast children, 
with those refugees, with those going through all kinds of hell, even hells of their own making, Christ lives with us and them even in those moments. Easter isn't over, by the way. It lasts for 50 days, so don't put your dresses and your eggs up yet. Easter, Christ's resurrection, has shown us that God is not some figure way up there or way out there beyond the clouds, back behind the blackness of space on some untouchable throne, manipulating humankind with a swirl of his finger or watching it unwind like the spring on a clock. Easter isn't about some divine plan that lies in the background as an excuse for all the terrible things that carry on in this life. Know what Christ's resurrection and the eternal reality of God have shown us is that in the words of Clarence Jordan, the resurrection of Jesus was simply God's unwillingness to take our no for an answer. He raised Jesus not as an invitation to us to come to heaven when we die, but as a declaration that he himself has now established permanent, eternal residence here on earth. That he is standing beside us, strengthening us in this life. The good news of the resurrection of Jesus is not that we shall die and go home to be with Him, but that He has risen and comes home with us, bringing all His hungry, naked, thirsty, sick prisoner brothers with Him. In other words, the actual good news of Easter is that Christ has risen and is still Emmanuel. Is still God with us. That doesn't change from Christmas to Easter. The eternal Alpha and Omega forever and ever God in Christ is still with us. God in Christ is with us in those moments that may seem to us as earth shaking, though they may amount to next to nothing in the grand scheme of eternity. God in Christ is with us even when we let self get in the way of what the Spirit calls us to do, when we strive to hold on to our selfish, comfortable ways because we think they're somehow holier than those ways that have come before or will come after. We worship the eternal God in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit for whom our lives are but a blink, a flash in the pan, a quick breath. And yet that same God chooses to be with us. I hope you find joy in that. I hope you find hope in that. Let it sink in. Find comfort in knowing that even when life seems to be going to hell, the God who is, was, and is to come is there with you, going through it with you. And that knowing will make it through. That God is there loving us through it. Walking alongside us knowing that there is always something greater to come. So may we find courage in knowing that when the way seems dark, When we don't know what tomorrow holds, we serve the Christ who is Alpha and Omega. A Jesus who has been through the grave and out the other side and calls us ever forward on a journey that will bring us heartache, it will bring us pain, but on a journey that leads towards salvation and life everlasting. May we find hope in the assurance that the God of creation, the Christ of the cosmos, the eternal Spirit of God, is far greater than any trouble we may ever have. And that God is not an excuse or a scapegoat, but an ever-living presence calling us deeper and deeper into wonderful, mysterious, and life-giving relationships. May we live as if we believe in the reality of Easter Sunday. And the good news that the eternal God has risen from the grave to prove that that same God still is here dwelling with us. Even in these fleeting moments we experience on this side of eternity. May we find hope in the God who was, who is now, and will always be. Let's pray together. Eternal God, who was, who is, and who is to come. Forgive us, Lord, when we hold on so tightly to that which is so temporary to you and to us. Help us, Lord, to see, at least as through a mirror dimly, the great scope of your eternal presence, of your unending love. Help us to feel it, 
Help us to share it. Help us, Lord, to live it as you live in us, through us, and around us. So come now, Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts and help us, Lord, to move in whatever ways you would have us to move. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.